Yeah, well, I've never spelled my own name wrong. He spells his name wrong and his partner's name's wrong. So now you look at it and you're like, okay, yeah, this letter's not right. It's fake. But the judges use this as her basis to grant this liquidation. Hello, everyone. You are listening to the Mutual Knowledge Podcast. I am Gauthier Lamote, your host, and my guest today is Sean Newman. He is a certified crypto investigator, and he's an author. Hi, Sean. Hi, how are you doing? Good, good. I just woke up, and I'm very happy to (laughs) interview you today. Thanks for being here. So, first of all, what is a crypto investigator, Sean? Well, I suppose a cryptocurrency investigator can be defined as somebody who goes and follows the chain, so to speak, because we all know that the blockchain never lies. So the great thing about the blockchain is unlike a bank statement, you have something to trace that just keeps going back and back and back. So, you know, in matters such as what we'll talk about today, where cryptocurrency flows, it Mm -hmm. is often, um, it's often necessary for somebody to be able to follow that flow. And well, Along the along the journey of, of Mirror Trading International, I've been certified and, and managed to to get some certificates behind my name so mm-hmm. that I could better understand the subject matter that I was dealing with. Mm, interesting. And so how did you come in contact with the blockchain industry yourself? Well, I suppose it was through Mirror Trading International. I mean, a lot of over the years, my friends and I had spoken about Bitcoin, we'd followed things, but you know, you don't get too heavily into it because it's always that, that thing on the side and there's always that trigger that brings you in, whether or not it's, it's an investigation such as this or your need to, to broaden your financial, your financial options in this world. So, you know, I, I had followed cryptocurrency, I followed Bitcoin, never really understood and being a technology person myself, never really taken the time to understand a lot of it. And then in about 2021, a friend of mine approached me and he said to me, you owe me a favor. And I said to him, well, what would that favor be? He said, well, I lost three Bitcoin in this thing called Mirror Trading International. And I said to him, yes. And he said, I'd like you to write a book because I'd written two previous books about the underworld in South Africa that had gone quite in depth with with gangsters and murder and, you know, all these things. You you were living in South Africa yourself for how long at the time? Yeah, I've I've lived here my whole life. Okay, okay, Um, so... Okay. despite spending a bit of time in the UK just prior to the pandemic. So he came to me and he asked me, funny enough, a UK national, and he said to me, you owe me this favor. And I said to me, yeah, let's, can we figure out something else? Like, do you want my second born child? Maybe my third born, you know, something other than a book, because I've written two books. They were bestsellers. And you kind of like, get over it and you move on in your life and after seven eight years of not writing i just you know it was off the bucket list oh you you felt rusty no yeah you know it's just um i think you just move on move on Mm, and he basically said to me well this is a story like you've never seen before and i kind of rolled my eyes at him and i said fine he said have you heard of Merit trading international and i said i had i'd watched an insert on a local investigative journalism program called carte blanche but, you know, I banked it and moved away and it was interesting, but, you know, not something that I would have normally followed in the media. So he said to me, here's the deal I have with you. Give me 30 days. So I said, OK. He said, 30 days, just go dig a bit, do what you do best. And if after 30 days you see no value in this, walk away, no harm, no foul, we square. I think he had a premonition that he knew what would happen. So I started off with, with a Zoom call that, that was recorded on YouTube. And basically, this Zoom call was the collapse of the scheme. Mm. So it was at the point where the, the head of the scheme had disappeared. The rest of the partners and, and, and the so-called top investors and, and you know, the crux, of the, the crux of the organization were talking about it. It was never meant to be recorded. And there were a whole bunch of these personalities. So I started watching that. And then I made a call to to the journalist who or the producer who had done this insert uh, as i knew her and she put me onto another journalist and he brought me up to speed so jan vermulen of my broadband had actually broken the story so at about the october of 2020 they had started putting extreme pressure on the scheme in terms of 
he had worked with the hackers that had hacked the database and all the information started flowing out. It was at the same time that the Financial Services Conduct Authority in South Africa had, had clamped down on them and there was just this big move. So Jan became an invaluable source of information and, and a, a real rock to bounce information off. And straight after that, I then started making calls to people who were involved. Mm -hmm. So you start off obviously with, with, with your base user who's lost maybe 10 euro to your guy who's lost maybe half a million euro. Yeah. And you hear their stories, but you know, those stories become a dime a dozen. And I'm not trying to diminish the stories because there's some real heartbreak involved in this. But if you're going to look at something like this, you can't always look at just the victim story. You've got to now try and get into the actual story of what was going on inside. So I started contacting people and eventually I got a breakthrough. And then the lawyers started talking to me from ah. all sides. And they started feeding me the paperwork that was coming out of court. And from there, I think we now... She's like, <laughs> we're past the two and a half. We're past, well, yeah, we, we, we're going on to year three now. And I think I'm so in depth in this. I've traveled the world chasing the story. But along the way, I met, I met a, a very interesting advocate and very, very senior companies expert because I had no idea about companies law. I knew about criminal law, <laughs> obviously, from my previous books. So I decided to get some mentors along the way. And he told me something that was incredibly interesting at the time. And I thought he was, you know, you crazy old man. What are you going on about? He said to me, you will realize in time, you are not writing a book about Meritrading International. You are writing a book about liquidations in South Africa. And oh. I laughed at him. And, you know, I don't think he's far wrong because where we are today on this, and I'll take you back in some history in a second as, as to how the whole thing has unfolded. Please. I think where we are today is, is I've learned that I would rather probably deal with the underworld of South Africa, and they're vicious, than with liquidation groups because there is more honor and ethics inside, <laughs> of, inside of the underworld, as strange as that may sound. You know, at least they'll look you in the eyes and say, I'm going to shoot you, and they will do it. They will follow through. Yeah, okay. I, I can totally like, get that. You know, it's, it's, it's this industry that's meant to be regulated and completely above board. But last weekend, we had one of the top liquidators in South Africa, somebody I dealt with, with with one of the previous books, the subject matter of two previous books, in fact, had been liquidated by this man. And he was shot on a highway not too far from here. Him and his son were assassinated. And I think that's what makes South Africa so different to the rest of the world is is we almost like everyone watches these 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 shows like narcos and things like that where it's murder for hire and all of that it, it it's real life it happens here you know you've been here you were here two weeks ago that's where we met yeah it's a beautiful country um but we have our hindrances in terms of corruption and well electricity supply as you learned very quickly I, I thought to myself yes it's a beautiful country but there are some details that that tell the the story yeah. uh, the underlying Absolutely. story for example th that's always suspicious when you get uh, when you are in a country where the super clean neighborhoods have practically nobody walking on the streets and every little uh, every little building or condo is uh, barricaded between barbed wire uh, barbed wires and brick walls and that's usually something that happens when you yeah. have uh, quite a concern regarding safety. So, yeah, I, I can see that. Absolutely. The underlying story just by looking at the streets, even, even the safest ones. Yeah. So the story of MTI begins in 2019. Mm -hmm. The name Mirror Trading International comes from the idea that they are doing mirror trading. So their platform of choice is a company called FX Choice registered in Belize. And what you do is, is you, yeah, we're going to get into that quite heavily here. Because <laughs> that's Fiscal the haven most and so exciting on. things that I've mm -hmm. found. So registered in Belize, and what people are doing is they are following the trades. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there's some big trading losses that are going on because these guys aren't, you know, pulling through what they are. So there's a bit of pressure that starts coming. So they reinvent themselves. They say, no, 
what you need to do is you need to pull your your funds out of there and you need to put it into a centralized fund because the more we've got to work with the better it's going to be and they then add the ideology that they are adding ai trading so they sell this idea that there is artificial intelligence they've got a bot this bot is miraculous it can work 24 7. it picks the market it picks the trade it's gonna it's gonna offer you eight percent a day 20 percent a month you know that kind of thing it's a compounded situation and people start flooding in because there is this this instantaneous moment of the perfect storm as it's gaining traction into 2020 we go into lockdown okay people are now worried about the centralization of their funds as we saw with the with with the bitcoin market and crypto in general a lot of stimulus checks and things now in south africa we didn't have those options of people paying in but what we need to understand is is that merit trading international operated throughout the world there were 380,000 people on the books now a lot of those were duplicate accounts so for reasons that we'll explain in a minute but then they decided to add the MLM aspect of it. So multi-level marketing. So now we've got a problem. So, so yeah, ju just, just for the record, for, for our viewers, because some people make a difference yeah. between uh, yeah. multi-level marketing and, uh, and good Ponzi. old Ponzi scheme. Do you make that difference yeah. or do you think the... Well, yes. Well, that's what, that's what I was about to say. Okay. Yes, you're spot on. So MLM is your pyramid. So the top people then get down legs and down legs and down legs and the bottom feeds the top constantly. So there's always a percentage that's shifting up. So be a 10%. Every person that signs up, the person who they signed up as, under, 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 there will always be that flow up. And eventually, you're, it's not sustainable because your base needs to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So it becomes an incredibly, incredibly positive or... Um, large uh mlm but then there's the aspect and and that's what's being fought, fought in court in south africa at the moment is they've brought an application to declare it a ponzi scheme so now it would appear according to the authorities that it had elements of both but they've chosen the ponzi aspect which is rob peter to pay paul i take from you and i give to somebody else and that's the constant flow of funds so i'm constantly needing a flow of funds in However, there was trading going on inside Merit Trading International. According to FX Choice, though, when they contacted in the July, um, August, August the 6th, they contacted by the Financial Services Conduct Authority, they say, no, there is trading going on, but there's massive losses going on within here. So what we've done is we have frozen 1,000, 1,280, 1,180 Bitcoin. Okay, uh -huh. they've frozen it in the funds. Now, here things become very curious because this affidavit is put out by a guy by the name of Daniel Stevenson. He says he's the operations director of FX Choice. And this is what's happening is all the videos that they're showing people are fake. They demo accounts that they're showing the trades on. They've manipulated these demo accounts. They've done all of this. And the FSCA built the case. Oh, so it was just a mock-up interface at the time? That's what they are saying. This is the allegation from FX Choice. So the, so the FSCA start this investigation. The difference here is, is there was another scam on the way, or not scam, there's another scheme on the way at that point called AfriCrypt in South Africa. The difference between the two, and both would collapse around about the same time, the difference between the two is Merit Trading International only takes deposits in crypto. There is no fiat currency involved. They only do withdrawals in cryptocurrency. So now there's this gray area about the Financial Services Conduct Authority's um, jurisdiction to go in here. And when I ask somebody very senior at the Financial Services Conduct Authority what the thought process was around this, the attitude was, well, the instruction was, yes, there's a jurisdictional problem, but it's a fucking scam. Oh, shit, okay. Maybe I shouldn't swear so much. Don't worry, but I can I'm, I can censor I'm that. Using, I'm, I'm, I'm using his exact words. It's a fucking scam. Shut the shit down. And that's a very gung-ho attitude for a regulator to have, is that, well, stuff the consequences. We're just going to, we're going to go ahead. However, AfriCrypt is the prime 
candidate in this because they're taking deposits in fiat and they're withdrawing in fiat. Mm -hmm. So there is there is jurisdiction there, but they leave Africa crypt alone. They leave it alone. And the reasons being, and, and, and one day I'll, I'll, I'll put this all out, but there's this whole team in the background that stems from a previous instance of this called BTC Global. And one of the individuals who went after BTC Global and couldn't be heard by the authorities is now driving this in a big way because there are personal vendettas. So there's a reason why this is getting to where it needs to be. Eventually, they put so much pressure on, the coins are frozen, there's a whole story about how they've moved exchanges and they've tried everything else and they're doing their whole thing. And I have my theories about what really happened there. And we'll go through that in a minute. But the owner, the, the so-called head of the, the company, gets on a plane to go to Brazil in November of 2020. He is literally going to fly out. He's going to go get servers ready. He's also just going to lie low for a bit. There's a very big deal on the go with the South African Tribal Council, and he, he gets out of Dodge, so to speak. Within a couple of weeks of him being gone, the whole thing implodes. That's it. He never returns to South Africa. Leaves his wife and his daughter behind, and off he goes. A year later, he surfaces and gets arrested in December of 2021 in Brazil for all things as having a fake identity document. That's what he gets arrested for. Oh. So the federalities, everything, grab him. It's public. It's all over the news. And his case starts. In his paperwork, he states he has started a family in Brazil. And then we go back to that whole ideology of the Paul LaRue saga, where Paul LaRue, you know, this, the, the, one of the, the Satoshi suspects in our, in our existence you know, used the same excuse on that side and the federal government of America couldn't get to him until they lured him out. Now, these are stories that have been around since 2017. So you can only imagine that Johann Steinberg knew about this at the time. So now there's an allegation that the girlfriend is pregnant, started a family, he's done what he has to do. And the case runs ahead till about June of last year. And since then, nothing. You can't find anything on the... On the, the government websites, there are no further updates about where this case has gone. It's just dead. In the meantime, the company gets liquidated in the December. So he leaves. Within a month, when it collapses on the 15th of December, there's this liquidation application. There are so many things wrong with the way that this application is brought. But there are so many blind eyes that get turned. So, for instance, paperwork that is pre presented to the judge is got the wrong documentation, the wrong annexures, all of this. But it's December, and in South Africa, December, not really much happens. We're all on holiday. You know, getting anything done in this country over that period is a nightmare. But these guys go in, and they go for it. The paperwork is wrong. But curiously, if you look at the court transcripts, they never argue the merits of the case. This starts inside the court between this advocate that is there to represent the losers and, and people who have real interest in this, but no names, like 5,000 of them is the number that is thrown. And what ends up happening is the judge gets sidetracked. She gets this letter put before her that nobody knows how it appeared. It appeared on a telegram group the day of the hearing. And this letter is purportedly Steinberg going, okay, I scammed you. I'm gone. I'm never coming back. Please understand, I've taken your money, but don't worry, my partners are going to start another one soon, so they'll scam you a second time. Don't stress about it. And the judge takes this letter as being completely correct. The problem with the letter is, I don't know how drunk I've ever been in my life. I don't know how drunk you've ever been in your life, but have you ever spelt your own name wrong? Uh, oh, one, it must have happened maybe once. Yeah, well, I've never spelled my own name wrong. He spells his name wrong and his partner's name's wrong. So now you look at it and you're like, okay, yeah, this letter's not right. It's fake. But the judge has used this as her basis to grant this liquidation. Now, the merits of the idea of should it have been liquidated or not is kind of inconsequential when there's fraud used to get this through the courts. Not only that, when you go through, there's an annexure called AMFL 11. And it's blurred, but it's like, it looks like, you know, when you put something through a printer and the ink, the toner cartridge is suddenly gone 
and there's that stripe through the middle and you can't see anything. I managed to get my hands on the original copy of that. And it's the person who's bringing the application, it's not even their account, that they're presenting as the evidence that this company can't pay them, the person. So I'm like, okay, there's some problems here. Then I started going through FX Choice. Now, when you're walking along a road of an investigation, you, you kick pebbles out the way and you look for rocks. The pebbles are the easy ones to clear out. So I contacted FX Choice and I said, hey guys, you know, you've returned the 1,280 Bitcoin to, to the liquidators. Um, who knew about this? I mean, it was made clear on the 6th of August of 2020 that there was this money sitting there. So it was pretty low hanging fruit to begin with that there was this amount. The difference was on liquidation, it was worth, I think, 315 million Rand. I think the euro at the moment is about 12 or 15 to 1. You'll know better because you've done your conversion since you've been here. Bitcoin soars. It just takes off in that period that they're waiting for this coin to come back. And it's suddenly worth 1.2 billion rand. It's worth a lot more. It just, it, it, it four X's in the period. And now it's really lucrative to have brought this liquidation. You know, you were guaranteed money to begin with. Now you really guaranteed serious money. So FX Choice, I start looking at, I send this email to them and I say to them, hey guys, you know, well done, you know, you did this and things like that. Could I perhaps talk to Mr. Stevenson? And the response comes back, yeah, this was a group effort. It wasn't just one person. So no. So I'm like, okay. How about I talk to then your legal department and they can get me the answers group wide and come back to me. I, you know, it's just write a reply and things like that. No. So I'm like, but you are literally, why are you stonewalling something that is very public knowledge? Why won't you? Nope, sorry, we have confidentiality. The only reason we, we dealt with the, the FSCA is because they were, um, they were the authority and that's in our contracts. But you're putting out press release telling everyone that you have returned the coin. So surely your confidentiality is just absolutely broken by this point. The next step is, is I start analyzing the affidavit and the affidavit doesn't make sense because it says when the Texas Exchange Authority dropped the notice, they froze the account. But then like six lines later, it says on this date at the close of Mirror Trading International's last trade. And I'm like, but that's a month after you say you froze the coins. What were they still doing trading? Because you said they closed a trade. Anyway, be it as it may another affidavit surfaces into the court case. This time the signature looks completely different to the first one, but it's the same person. But this time it's not notarized, it's not stamped, it's not anything. It just really looks like a pixelated bad Photoshop copy. So I start suspecting that now we've got a problem. Either, either there's a problem at FX Choice or there's a problem in the local attorney's offices that are trying to blow the case up on the Ponzi side and put information in. So I ask the questions again. I get blanked again. Wow. Then I realize something. There's a set of statements. I get my hands on the original email with the FSCA. And in that original email, FX Choice have attached the statements of account for the trading. And on this one particular account number, I notice that the exact same document they now say is in Mirror Trading International's name when it's with the FSCA. But the lawyers for the estate, put in a set of statements that have the same account number, but now it's under Steinberg's name. And I'm like, hang on, hang on, hang on. How do we have two sets of statements with different names on them? Same account number, same trades, different names. Somebody is fudging something here. So I fire off a letter to FX Choice and I fire off a letter to, to the liquidators. No one responds to me for four or five months, but now we're back in lockdown again. So. I'd send out an email that says, I've tried to get hold of the notary in the UK. He's blanking me. You guys are blanking me. Everyone's blanking me. Mark my words. When lockdown ends, if somebody doesn't start answering these questions, because there is major problems here, you can't have the same account with all the same data with different names. It sounds like we are just playing a game of moving shells around here. Something is not right. I will go to the UK and I'll go find this notary myself. Nobody responds. In the meantime, we have this massive thing called Pandora. The Pandora papers get released. I don't 
know how I managed to, but through every contact I had, there were probably only five journalists in the country in South Africa that had access to Pandora. I got one to sit down with me. I was given two hours in the database and I searched FX Choice. And what popped up was a major problem. Oh. So I had seen the name prior. It's Trust Limited. And FX Sorry, Choice. Can you just re repeat yeah. uh, what you've seen? Uh, there was a network uh, issue. Okay. Oh, I'll cut that. So, CSS Trust Limited is a company registered in Belize and it is a trust company. Pandora Papers, the ICIJ, literally named CSS Trust as one of the big power brokers in these, these, these situations who literally take money and obscure companies under trusts. So effectively what ends up happening is they named as a power broker, but they share the same offices as FX Choice, the same address. So I'm like, hang on. I get into Pandora, I search, a name pops up. This name is a Russian individual called Maroslav Ansonov. Anisimov. And there's a chain of emails where basically they're moving from, from a, another trust company to CSS Trust and all the phone lines and everything need to be moved. There's financial documents that show that there was an investment into another exchange that was banned by, by, the, by the American SEC and had to pay fines. There's, there's just a flow of funds. So now I have a name. Now I have a problem. Because the law firm, or the address that this affidavit was deposed to, is stamped, or is the address on the affidavit just happens to have a Russian law firm on the top form or top uh, top uh, floor of the building in London. So now I'm like, hang on, hang on, things are starting to look a little bit like interesting here, especially in light of the Russian-Ukraine war just about to start at that point in February last year. So I start looking deeper into it, and then his name pops up again in the Panama paper, uh, the Paradise Papers. This time under another company's name, FIBO Group. So now we've got FX Choice and FIBO Group. The problem there is, is when Steinberg had a meeting with the FSCA and was interviewed the second time, he told them he deals with two exchanges. One, FX Choice. Two, the FIBO Group. I'm like, hang on. How, do we, how is he able to mention the exact companies that are linked to this particular Russian? Then you go back. In order to facilitate himself leaving the country, he sends out a letter to his partners, but he says he received it anonymously. He, he wrote the letter. We can prove via IP address. That says, you, your life is imminently in danger by the Masons and the Russians. Now, the Mason that is in discussion is the head of the FSCA's enforcement unit. We all knew that he's a Mason. That's fine. That, you know, that kind of conspiracy theory take aside. But how did he know back then that there were Russians involved unless he was speaking to this particular individual? Now my spidey senses are tingling completely. So I get on a plane and I go to the UK. First, I go to the offices of these, of this, these people and I meet this Lithuanian receptionist. And I turn around and I ask her for Daniel Stevenson. No, it's no Daniel Stevenson. There never has been one here. Okay, fine. Leave there. Phone the notary. End up at the notary's office. The guy, like, literally, when we start talking about things, starts shaking. And then he takes the document that I have and takes the document that he has, but noting that in that file that he opens up, there is no passport copy of this Daniel Stevenson because I personally don't believe he exists. He opens it up, pulls the two affidavits out, puts them against the window, and shows me that the signatures are different. He then gives me copies of what he's got. Now I've got three, four different signatures. So I come back to South Africa, and I, I depose an affidavit about what I found. And in the interest of doing good, I figure out how their email system works, and I send an email, and I get a response from this Mr. Stevenson. Yes, yeah, Sean, my signatures, no problem, da-da-da-da-da, Dan. And I'm like, yeah, that's very strange for a company that wouldn't talk to me at all over the last year and a half. Now, all of a sudden, you're just free-flowing on this one. 
They're forthcoming. The yeah, suddenly. I checked the IP addresses of the email header. St. Petersburg, Russia. The war has started. I'm like... When was that? So, uh, like, what's the date of so, this? So, so we're talking March last year. Okay. Okay. So, 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 so now we've got an alleged British citizen, a UK national sitting in Russia, busy... Um, busy going through it it's interesting to, to to notice that these guys never used a vpn to to make it no. it look coherent no. like, yeah. like, exactly. do, do you exactly. think they they felt uh almighty and uh, above any kind of punishment or do you Absolutely. think they were just reckless well you've got to look at the registration of the company to begin with this is a registered financial services provider in belize in belize you literally need like a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars security they you the only rule you have is that you can't sell to people in belize any of your services and and quite literally it's legal to co-mingle funds so your your investors or your exchange users as well as your funds are all just intermixed you know mm -hmm. there's, there's 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 no way of tracing what's going on so it just makes things far more interesting in the meantime, you've got this liquidation raging. You've got guys that have a, one point, a billion rand to spend. And they ramp up what is known as 418-417 inquiries in South Africa. Now, liquidators are given incredible power here. So 418-417 is where they can literally pull you in, interrogate you, mm -hmm. and you have to answer every question that they put to you in front of this magistrate. The thing is, is that they can't use your answers against you in a criminal case later on, but you have to you you, you have to implicate yourself. If you are asked a question, you've got to implicate yourself. You've you, you you've got to answer it, even if, by virtue of that, you have committed a crime. You have to admit to it. But so, but that cannot be used against you afterwards. If you are honest, if oh. you are honest about a hundred percent everything, then then they can't use it in a criminal complaint. Interesting. So they ramp these things up. But the problem here is, is that a lot of money starts to be made. So you see a lot of litigation coming on. In the meantime, the only source of alleged data is this back office. Now, the back office gets very interesting as well. So you've got this whole FX choice thing, and this is where my mind starts like buzzing, is you've got the FX choice situation You've got the individuals here who've lost money, who've made money, and now you've got liquidators who are making just as much money, mm -hmm. and if not more. So then you've got the back office. The back office gets retrieved from a company in India called Maxtra. So Maxtra give them a copy of the database. This database is quite literally a SQL database. So now, easily manipulated. And this is the basis that they start going after these individuals. They, they identify the top 200 and, and they, they, they bring the full might of everything against them. And here's the interesting thing. To date, a document made its way into the public realm. And, and I know a lot of people like to, to put it on me. But for once in my life, I need to turn around and not take credit for it. But a document makes its way into the public realm and... It's a liquidation and distribution account, like literally maybe a month ago. And what happens here is it's a breakdown of everything. So it shows how much commission was paid on the cryptocurrency, how much the lawyers are making, and these figures just start looking something ridiculous. So the liquidators stand to make um, 135 million rand between six of them. They also stand, they, they have spent to date 115 million rand and they have recovered 14 million rand. Wow. So they've spent 101 million rand over and above what they've recovered. So, and that's what happens in South Africa, unfortunately. So for the sake of, for the sake of explaining it, let's call them all unproven, untested. The courts are still deciding, but let's call it a scam. Okay. Let's call it just for this example. The, the, the irony in this perpetuation, and this, this comment's going to get me into a bit of trouble, but it's, it's time that it gets said, and it gets said straight. In South Africa, what happens is, let's say the scam happens. 
after the scam, my argument is, is people willingly had a choice to get involved in that scam. They listened to what was being said. They made a decision. Right or wrong, and it is wrong to scam somebody, and I'm not saying that Mirror Trading International is a scam. I'm saying if you look at scams in South Africa in general and then liquidations that follow. Because, again, because I don't want to pre-pronounce before the court has. But mm-hmm. you have a scam. People choose to get involved in that scam. They put their money in. The scam crashes. There is devastation. There is chaos. There is just absolute you know, people are wanting to kill themselves. Their life savings are gone. But then something miraculous happens. Hope appears. Hope appears in the ideology that you have a liquidation. Mm. There is money that they found. You are going to get something back. There is hope. The problem is, in South Africa, liquidators have this great way of doing things. They stretch it out over 10, 15 years. It happened in something else called Creon which was another pyramid scheme that collapsed in South Africa. They collected 100 million. They spent 90 million, gave 10 million back to to investors, and then closed the whole thing off because the estate was running dry. The problem here is MTI has too much money in its estate. So now this hope disappears. People get scammed a second time. And sometimes I wonder if the, the advocate wasn't correct and the name of the book should be after the scam because the second scam starts. And what happens is, is you have these individuals that then legally all come in like vultures and start feeding off of it. So these 418, 417 inquiries are yielding what they suggest, a lot of information. I personally know of people that have gotten there that have been net losers. So why you need to interrogate somebody who lost money other than to make money, it's an, absolute, it's an absolute sham. However, I was approached by somebody in, Dece- in, in, in October last year, and they said to me they were having problems they were trying to settle. And if they could convince me, they believed they could convince the liquidators. Mm. I said to me, you're probably approaching the one person who they don't like because the FX choice thing really threw up a couple of roadblocks for them that they couldn't answer and still still can't. So, but regarding but that enough. question regarding that scam, so you said it was a hundred and fifteen million rands. So for yeah. our, our listeners in the US or in Europe, that that's about a bit more than six million dollars or six million euros. Uh, yeah. How many people? Um, was it um on how many people was it spread um, no no that no well i mean this is the thing it's just groups of lawyers and liquid uh, the liquidators haven't even taken their money yet hmm. so that is literally just on legal okay it's but, legal but the, the, the people who lost everything yeah nothing nothing they've got nothing back okay nothing. and how many people were there who um uh, who invested in the first place well you know this is where things become interesting is because there's 380,000 members on the books, mm-hmm. but a lot of people were creating multiple accounts to, to, to collect the, to collect the, the percentages up okay. their own chain. So probably fairly so less than that. Out, reinvest, take out, reinvest, take out, reinvest, take out, reinvest. So probably 30, 40,000 people, if or let's call it 80, just to, for the sake okay. of brevity, you know, um, okay. but you're talking Anywhere they talk the amounts, anywhere from if if their numbers are to be believed, which I don't, and I'll tell you why now, um, eighteen thousand to forty thousand Bitcoin. So, it's um, <coughs> it's a lot of Bitcoin. It's 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 a lot. Understanding that only a thousand two hundred eighty have been found. But yes, yes, yes. Some of the problems that come in in that, in investigating various. So, so this client basically said to me, "I will pay for you to be trained up, and in your training, come after that, and I will give you all my data. And if you don't believe me after that, then then I'm stuffed." He did all of that, and he stayed true to word, and and he did. He gave me everything, and I have a number, and there's a number out there that is completely ridiculous um that they're pushing but i understand why that is but in that i started looking at multiple people's accounts 
Now, here's the thing with the back office. I believe that prior to the liquidators getting it, so I'm not putting it on them, there's a benefit of a doubt here, is that prior to them getting it, somebody deleted critical data out of that database. The problem with that critical data is, is that it comes from the deposit side. So it was purposely meant to obscure deposits coming in to slow down the investigation of the flow of how much flowed in here. By the time they got it, I think a lot of that data was missing because after three, four different inquiry sections with different clients, I've noticed a wallet address. The wallet address has popped up as being a deposit address. Now, my client's data, the one data, the one is like three Bitcoin that he deposited in. Another client's his point, uh, is, is about another two Bitcoin. The problem is, is if you go to the blockchain on this wallet address, it's 0.04 of a Bitcoin has only ever traveled through this wallet in its entirety. So it makes it physically impossible for those to have been the receiving addresses. But you get where I'm going with this. So somebody has changed the deposit address. However, where the problem comes in is that this is now known that the back office is unreliable. But the liquidators teams have not alerted anyone that this anomaly exists. Now, if I can pick it up in three, four different clients sequ uh, sequences and looking at the data, they've looked at hundreds of thousands of these things. So I've managed to find out that this particular wallet address in the back office is attributed to 44,000 transactions valued at 4,400 odd Bitcoin. It's impossible. It's received 0.04 of a Bitcoin in and out in its entirety. Ergo, they cannot present to a court of law that this back office data is anywhere near being reliable because if that's been changed, other things could have been changed. So what they're doing is they're using these inquiries to try and now suss out a percentage point of how reliable this back office is, but presenting to the court that it is indelibly correct. It is 100% correct. And their cryptocurrency guys have charged 16.9 million rand to date, which is what? It's close on a million euros just to have hidden this fact from everyone. Mm -hmm. And these, this is where my problem comes in with this is it is not necessarily that the company should not be where it is right now. I have, I, I liken it to, if it was meant to be, it would have gone there organically in the end. But it seems to me that there's been a lot of agendas and a lot of help along the way that has created this. The perfect storm that created the company is the perfect storm that has ended the company. And the only people in the middle of it that are being hit by the tornado on all sides are people who've put money in. Now, if I came to you and said 10 euro in this, would you cry over 10 euro? Probably not. We use it all the time. I mean, whether or not you take a sports stake on a football team's bet or, you know, you buy a ticket to a concert, somebody doesn't deliver the ticket, 10, 10 euros is not going to kill you. And in the crypto community, most people usually do not cry over 5,000 euros or 5,000 exactly. pounds. Or so. there we like, like There's a threshold that is um, artificially higher than in the general population. Precise. Exactly. So now, what happens when I start seeing claims from people where they've gone to fill out a form, get it stamped by the police, and get it sent to the liquidators, and the value is 10 euro? How much must that 10 euro be worth to that one person to go through that effort? Because nobody is that stubborn in this world. I'm not doing bureaucracy for 10 euro. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a cost uh, benefit ratio. If if you earn yeah. fifty bucks an hour and you're an investor, you're probably not going to spend ten. You're not going to be spending five yeah. or ten hours exactly. of your time to get ten euros back. So you, yeah. But these are the kind of claims that are coming in, hmm. and these are the kind of people that are losing their money twice. My problem is, is I liken Mirror Trading International to Minority Report. The movie with tom cruise yeah so if i know that you are going to murder somebody okay and i come and i murder you to stop you from murdering somebody 
does that make me the murderer, the hero? Does that make you the bad guy? Or does it make you the victim? Despite the knowledge we had. So it becomes the impossible question in psychology. The impossible question in psychology, for anyone that doesn't know, is you're standing on a train track. The train is hurtling towards six people. If you intervene and flick the switch and it only kills one person. Yeah, it's a trolley problem. Yeah, the trolley problem. There we go. Are you saving six people or are Uh, you now complicit in uh, having changed fate? Of course. Or can your conscience live with the idea that you left fate to continue and do what it had to do and more people died? How do you deal with it? And that's where I like in Mirror Trading International. You have a grudge that leads to a whole bunch of real, for lack of a better term, bullshit Mm -hmm. actions that are concerted at every point of breaking normal procedure in the name of doing the right thing. So it is sold to whoever does what they do as doing the right thing at any cost. But at what point in doing the right thing do you become just as bad as the people that you are to be protecting others from? Or is it because you're a white knight that you can do whatever you want without fear of reprise or consequence? So from your initial setup to the application, to the application, I mean, shit, I've had senior people say to me, my God, it took the dumb son of a bitch six months longer than we thought to fuck off out the country. To me, that's like we had a plan. There was a plan. You know, the paperwork that wasn't correct before the court, the lording of everything, going through everything, the now siphoning of funds, that money still belongs to people. But here's the twist. And I alerted somebody to this. A very senior individual inside this liquidation had an argument with me two years ago about this. And I got quite passionate. And that's a problem because... I shouldn't care so much about what I'm seeing here, but there's an injustice that I just can't deal with. And it's become personal in many realms. And it's wrong, but it's not going to stop. Because now that I've, un- I've lifted the lid on Pandora's box, well, we might as well have the fun with it. The symbol is, is I said to them, you've brought an application before the courts to declare this a Ponzi. You say it is to return all the illegal money that was paid out so anything that you were paid out you need to pay back and then it even gets distributed i call bullshit on this because the moment you do that and it was like prophesizing what was going to happen one of two areas is going to become interested either the asset forfeiture unit but i doubt that they would because everything that you have gathered is fruit of a poison tree so cannot be used in a criminal complaint or our version of the American IRS, the South African Revenue Service. And this individual who sits in inquiries and questions people with a deadpan voice told me, I couldn't give a shit if anyone sees a cent back or not. They need to learn that investing in a scam should make you think twice next time about doing it. The shit needs to end. I said to him, you're talking about a billion rand that people could use, even if it is 10, 20, 30 cents to the rand. You are telling me you couldn't give a crap that your motive here is, is to see these things go down in a ball of flames at any cost. And he said to me, couldn't care, couldn't care. The person who helped him bring it, couldn't care. And maybe that's where I switched. And I just, I explained that to me, that is the most despicable form of human being that could possibly exist because people know that there is money there. They have hope that something will come back to them. Whether or not they were gullible, whether or not they were greedy, it doesn't matter. It was still their money. Yeah, and you're not the one who's uh, who's got the moral high ground to, to exactly. double punish them. Especially when you are billing out and using their money to line your coffers and buy cars and houses and, and trips and holidays and, you know, whatever. It, 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 yeah, it, it, would be, it would be the same thing as not, uh, not pursuing a murderer saying, oh, yes, sir, your daughter has been murdered, but, yeah. you know, she should have known better and you yeah. will learn the lesson. Don't let your daughter go on the, inter- uh, on the Internet. That's it. People <laughs> make mistakes, especially if you think back to COVID 
and what we were all living under. I mean, in South Africa, you couldn't buy cigarettes, you couldn't buy liquor, you couldn't buy roast chicken in a shop. They really wouldn't even let us buy clothes at one point. It was that bad. You know, we had people who were killed in, in, in informal settlements because they went into their gardens and moved past their front doors. The army people beat them to death. It, is, it was dra draconian. So now you've got people who have, in, in the face of losing everything, have found some hope, and then it collapses, and then there's hope again. The difference is, and I liken it to this, the first scam you have a choice to get involved in. The second scam you have bugger all choice. That is, that is made for you. So that ideology has now come to fruition. Our revenue services stepped in and said, on the basis that it is what you say it is, oh, liquidators, yeah, we're going to issue a tax return and levy penalties and interest, which, let's just get this straight, they have every right to. And in South Africa, it is sometimes scary, but incredibly encouraging to see the efficiency with which that area of government works. They are beyond reproach at the best of times in the way that they conduct things, the way they stick to within the law, and the way they do things. They have now stepped in, and basically their claim is for everything that is left within the estate that the liquidators haven't spent. And it was called. That was all born out of the ideology that there was this need to get this, this, this order, which ironically, today, as we sit, was rested last year, June. The judge then called for everyone back in November for one final day's worth of clarification. And since the 8th of November, we've had no judgment as to, is this a Ponzi? Is it legal? Does it need to go to full trial? Does it need to go to oral evidence? Is it being dismissed? What is happening? We have none of these answers. And nothing has happened since. So it just seems like there's this whole scenario where everything happens all at once and then it just goes quiet. Happens all at once. In the meantime, there's cases that have been brought against the top 20 to the value of 4 billion rand um, that they are personally liable. It's, it's just, it's a free for all. I mean, between the experts and the, the, the lawyers, it's just a feeding frenzy at the moment. And yet you still have that guy who expects his 10 euros back waiting for it. Not a single cent has been paid out to date. And if you want my honest opinion, I don't think it's going to happen. Hmm. I think we're going to, the same person told me that they expect it to, to go on for 10 to 15 years. I think the plan is 10 to 15 years. If you're softening out 50 million a year. Yeah, and then again, psychologically, those who have lost 10 to $15,000 or multiply that by, uh, by 20 to have rents, those people will probably get over it in, in 10 years. They, they will yeah. lose hopes and uh, lose any kind well, of hope. Well, I mean, I mean let's, just, let's just focus on that. We've got a couple of things here exactly on that. The first is the shame. Mm -hmm. Once you label it something, and, and this was half my argument, is why give it a label? Because the shame that comes with it, people don't want their wives, their kids, all of that to know they're in, they were duped. So then they just leave it. Mm -hmm. So that brings the claim ratio down already. Your second part is the worry that they don't want the authorities to know that they had this Bitcoin to begin with. Mm -hmm. So they don't claim. The third part is we've just gone through this very hectic thing where the, where the mortality rate around the world like shot up exponentially over, over the last two years. And we're just coming, we've just come out of it. But at the height of this, we had COVID. So how many of those investors are dead? And like normal things, people just don't know that their family member invested in something and, and that there's the right to claim. Then you've got the overseas, the overseas realm. And this is where things become interesting. The American authorities launched at that time, it was before FTX, launched the largest claim against any crypto scheme in terms of Mirror Trading International. And it was this massive claim of, I think, 1.8 billion or something. And they came for it and they brought a case in Texas. 
The liquidators have now brought a Chapter 15 bankruptcy filing in, a, in, in Florida that has been granted. So now they're protected under that. That case in Texas is probably just going to fall flat for the moment and all of that. You've still got Steinberg in Brazil. But there's been no attempt to claim any money back from a single international person. Why? They'll tell you it's because the barrier to cost is too high. Well, according to South Africa, they're not afraid of cost. My theory is because the lawyer that's going to handle it isn't, isn't part of the pot. Oh. <laughs> so why, why give it to somebody outside of the inner circle? Okay, that's the, that's the good old saying, I want to stop corruption or I want to take part in it. But, but for three years down the line, I am yet to hear of some of the big boys being, being taken on who are out the country. Wow. In fact, I'm hearing of people who are far less liable. I mean, the one, the, the one was for three Bitcoin um, was the claim. I've heard of claims of... 0.001 of a Bitcoin. So you're going that hell bent in South Africa. But guys who are known to have pulled out 20, 30, 40, 50, some, some even 60 Bitcoin, not being touched overseas. And it's not like nobody knows where they are. They know exactly where they are. So they're going to touch them in 10 years when things have settled down? Well, you see, here's another thing about South African law. If you don't claim a debt within three years, it's called prescription. You can't claim that debt. Three years. Okay. In, in France, for three example, years. it's it's uh, more than 10 years. Yeah. So three years in South Africa. It's called the law of prescription here. So wow. December the 28th of this year, bam, prescription happens. Mm -hmm. Anyone who's not seen anything claimed against them. And maybe this is me sitting here saying, well, TikTok. TikTok, hurry up. But how are you going to lodge that many claims? And then, oh, hang on. There's a lot of money at stake to be done. It's a very cynical thing. I started out believing everything. And as we sit here, I don't think that advocate was incorrect when he said, you're not writing a book about Merit Trading International per se. You're writing about liquidations. The other thing he said, which is very, very interesting, and it's a cynical view from somebody who has seen the inside of court multiple times and is, 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 is a doyen of the industry in terms of companies law. He said to me, you will learn very quickly that if you think, and I'm going to use his exact words, if you think you're fucked when a company is running, you have no idea how hard you're about to be fucked when it's in liquidation. And, and, and this, is the, this is the nature of it. It's, it's, it's sad because there is a chunk of money sitting there. And they'll tell you, well, we can't just pay that out. And I understand you can't just pay it out. But you're not investigating who's owed what. You're trying to investigate where you can get more money at any cost. Now, to me, maybe, maybe my maths is completely wrong. I didn't take maths from grade, from grade 10 onwards. I did business economics. But even in business economics... The logic of spending a million euro to recover 10 euro doesn't exist, or a thousand euro, or even a hundred thousand euro. Even spending a million euro to get half a million euro back does not make sense from a business point of view. And I've heard the argument, oh no, you have no idea, there is more coming and you're going to see it hectically, it's going to come and it's going to flow. The difference is you have anomalies in your back office that were probably put there on purpose to roadblock you from doing your job. But the fact that you are meant to be an expert and you haven't managed to see it yet tells me you're not out there for the truth. You're out there for the payday. And the more you hide, the more obstacles you hide, the more you lie to a court, the more financially lucrative it is. And that is exactly what is going on here. I've been accused of every single thing under the planet. I really don't care. Because at the end of this, I've always had this firm theory, and it's maybe the wrong theory, is if you want to burn me, we'll burn together. I'm not afraid to admit where I've gone wrong in this world and in this life. But many other people are. And maybe that's what makes this 
more interesting is that it started out as looking at a singular case for a friend of mine. It's evolved into something, just the more information, the more you realize that, for instance, the advocate sitting inside that courtroom that day, who was leading the opposition, was then doing inquiries for the liquidators thereafter and being paid by them to do inquiries. Wow. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. So the whole shared in front of the judge and the whole argument, but again, these transcripts are never meant to be found. So the guy who literally tried to stop the liquidation made sure there was no argument on the merits of the case, got it postponed for four days, and then four days later, the next judge looks at it and assumes that the merits of the case have been argued and the only thing they need to deal with is, is it opposed or is it unopposed? suddenly he finds out that it's unopposed because this guy steps back and he's no longer a, a threat, grants the liquidation without the single piece of the, the, the story being argued in, in, in open court. Bam! Provisional liquidation, extension of powers, here we go. He is suddenly leading inquiries and questioning people on behalf of the liquidators and being paid for it. It's just... Then representing a liquidator at a master's meeting. The master saying that he's not going to allow claims. Here's another fun one before we wrap up, I suppose. The liquidators need to be reappointed, okay? So when you go from provisional liquidation to final liquidation, at the first meeting of creditors, in theory, you are meant to vote for a liquidator or a group of liquidators. The liquidators manage to, to cut a deal amongst themselves with another person coming in who's trying to get appointed, that they won't oppose each other. And they'll just say it's unopposed and convince the master. The master agrees and, and appoints them, okay? Even though one of which who, who brokered this whole deal was not going to be appointed, and probably there would have only been about two of them that got through that day out of the six. Then the second meeting of creditors, you're meant to vote for resolutions. So... A resolution that is logical that I knew that I know was proposed was going to be from the creditors' side. We will create a board of creditors that are made up of auditors, crypto experts, um, creditors, you know, a financial director, you know, captains of industry that will then take advice from the general body of creditors because obviously the liquidators are stupid to think that they can listen to instructions from 30, 40, 80,000 people. They were going to form a body. The liquidators, however, wanted a couple of resolutions. And one of the big resolutions that they wanted was, you agree to everything that we've done leading up to this was necessary in terms of spending this. And you empower us to do whatever we believe is necessary going forward. So come the day of the second meeting of creditors, first we get postponed last uh, two years ago in the December, COVID and all, I go down to the master's office twice to go and try and view the files and things like that in the December, closed, closed, closed. We come back in the March. All of a sudden, now listen to this. One of Steinberg's companies, JNX Online, is liquidated prior to this. And the reason for the liquidation application is that it owes Mirror Trading International money it cannot pay. That's a point you need to remember. We get to this meeting. The master says, all the claims, there's over four, 5,000 of them submitted from, P, from individuals, are illegible. Now, the word illegible means you cannot read them. You cannot make them out. There's a problem with that. The problem is, I helped prepare those claims with an advocate. I helped him with it. They're not illegible. I know they're not illegible. So I'm watching this video, this Zoom with my mouth open by now. So he clears four, 5,000 claims off the table straight away. Boom. There the voting rights of this advocate disappear. And he accepts a singular claim against the estate of Mirror Trading International. The only claim he accepts that day, which means it'll be the only claim that gets to vote on the resolutions. The claim is from JNX Online, the company that got liquidated now suddenly is owed money by Mirror Trading International. So hang on. You liquidated a company. One of the liquidators got one of his women from his office appointed as the liquidator. 
And now all of a sudden, instead of it owing Mirror Trading International money, Mirror Trading International owes it money in order to get a vote. That sounds like you're manipulating a system second to none to make sure that the resolutions that don't suit you don't get passed and your resolutions do. Be it as it may, on the basis of the JNX claim, the resolutions are passed. The liquidators have unfettered power, unfettered access, and there we go. I think the next meeting was about SARS, the South African Revenue Service, and boy, did that master fight, fight tooth and nail to stop them trying to admit that claim. It's unheard of that a master would fight that hard against a government institution make laying claim against an estate. So now you've got a problem because clearly there's problems in the master's office and things like that. So it just, it's, it's a tangled, dirty web. And as I say, the beginning of this whole story is quite transparent. It's quite transparent as to what has happened and who's done what and how they've done it. It's what has happened after that is far more dark and seedy and more undercover than anything I've ever in my life seen. Hence the, the, the argument that I would rather actually deal with the underworld. Thank you so much. This is absolutely enlightening, and I have the feeling we could even even make a part two of this interview if you if you're. Uh, it's a Netflix to do that. series waiting to happen. Yeah, th th this is very interesting, and it really inspired me a lot. Thank you so much because when I was working for the Free Republic of Liberland, we had a, a very teeny tiny, nothing in size compared to what you just described, but we had a, a scam of people uh, involving people selling fake tokens of the Free Republic of Liberland, damaging the, the reputation of the project. And I, I found it very hard to get investigation from people just, as you said, blanking you, not, not answering mm. to you. And uh, I thank you so much for this interview because I deeply admire the, uh, the determination that, that you've shown to... to uncover all these uh, all these dirty secrets and the very cynical aspects of it uh is there any uh, any last word you would like to add regarding that or regarding the the crypto world in general the blockchain industry uh, i think you know i think the one enlightening part here is is that the softwares that are used today are becoming so advanced in terms of tracking this kind of crime mm -hmm that I think going forward, it's going to be a lot more difficult for these things. You know, I mean, people will always adapt. I mean, there's a reason why the word Ponzi gets thrown around from, from you know, the dates that it does to, to today, the Madoffs and things. But I think that despite all of this, the underlying technology of blockchain, the ideology behind it, is as sound as anything, and it's probably the biggest gift this world has ever been given, if we can just get people's heads around that this is not always... Everything starts off this way. It will, it will normalize. The more people understand about it, the more people research it, the more accessible it becomes, the better it's going to be for, for humanity going forward. So I have great belief in blockchain. Um, just sometimes not the the bad the bad actors that are behind it. But I do believe with things like FTX and all of that, it will start weeding itself out because the curators of the blockchain are the very people who talk today, who invest in it, and who are syst systemically trying to get its applications put in the right places. It's, 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 it's got an unlimited amount of application. People need to understand that it's not just about Bitcoin. It's not just about Ethereum. It's not just about a tokenization of the system. It's not about a decentralization. There's the, the application is just so much bigger. So I'm grateful to this investigation for bringing me into that world and giving me the ability to, to learn more and, and to better myself in terms of the, of the knowledge. So, yeah, we'll just keep investigating and keep, keep tracking and tracing as we go along. Thank you so much. 
Everyone, this was Mutual Knowledge. You were listening to Sean Newman, crypto investigator and author of a book whose name and references will be in the video's description. Look him up and read that book to learn more about this fascinating case. Thank you so much, Sean. Pleasure.